Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. First, I want to highlight another great perennial. Becky Carroll shares with us the importance of native pecans. We travel to Greenleaf's Hidden Lake Nursery to see how they graft peach trees. And then David Hillock introduces the 2022 Oklahoma Proven Tree of the Year. Finally, we head back to OSU's herbarium with Mark Fishbein to learn about a herbarium project that you could get involved with. I've got another great drought tolerant plant I want to share with you. This is called Gray Santalina. We have it growing here in our rock garden because it does like good rocky and good drainage soils. So you can see here it's got that gray foliage and usually that's kind of a telltale sign of a plant that is drought tolerant and so it can handle our Oklahoma heats and sometimes those drier soil conditions that we might experience as we head into those summer months. Now the foliage itself actually kind of reminds me of an Arizona cypress. It's kind of got that grayish green uh, color that it brings to the garden landscape and you can see up close it has kind of a, a fuzzy texture to it. What's unique about this is it, it actually, the species um, comes from the Greek word meaning dwarf cypress. So it, it doesn't surprise me that it sort of reminds me of the Arizona cypress. Um, and you can see how it kind of spreads. It'll create these kind of rolling mounds of this sort of like a cloud-like effect in your landscape. Now in late spring, it also will um, put up these flower buds. Now these flower buds, while well, it is in the Asteraceae family and they look like kind of like the little buds or the eyes of a daisy, that's because they are sort of that eye of the daisy or the eye of the mum because they lack the ray florets that you often see around the mum or the daisy. Instead, they just have these button-like flowers that sort of polka dot the landscape. But that contrast between the bright yellow and the gray foliage makes a nice addition to any landscape. Now, if you're not really interested in the gray color in your landscape, there also is a green uh, Santalina to check out. Both of these are hardy from zone 6 to 10 and again a great addition in any Oklahoma garden. Most people associate the three sister crops like bean, corn, and squash with the Native American tribes here in the United States. But there's actually a crop that's grown in Oklahoma that may have even a longer history with the indigenous people of the United States, and that's pecans. Uh, pecans are found in, in the wild, native pecans are found from Wisconsin down through Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, a, a little bit of Arkansas, but mainly Oklahoma and Texas. And those pecans are, are growing wild. They're native to the area. They're grown in riparian type of, of soils, very deep and rich uh, river bottoms, and they are um, spread along those creeks and tributaries. And so that's where you find a lot of our native pecan trees and native pecan groves in the state of Oklahoma. And so all the trees that, that are grown in other states like Georgia or New Mexico, Arizona and California, those have all been planted. So we have something special here in the state that we need to recognize and, and know a little bit more about uh, the benefits of native pecans. 
So I have some examples of some native pecans that were selected from different parts of the state. Some of them are too small to really be uh, useful for production, but then you can see that they are quite different in size and shape. Each native pecan tree is going to be genetically different from the others. And so that's why we see a lot of differences in, in quality as well. And so for native pecan growers, uh, whenever they are uh, managing their orchards, they need to worry about things like thinning the trees to get enough sunlight into the trees. And then look at fertilization, which can be done by using clovers or conventional fertilizers, but also managing for uh, pests like uh, pecan nut case bear or pecan weevil. But most of the time, if one of their native trees may have issues with scab or other problems, that might be one that they would think about removing in their thinning process rather than trying to spray consistently to keep the, the disease at bay. There, um, a lot of, of different native pecans uh, may have very thin shells. Most people think of a native as being very hard shell, very thick, and very little meat. But, in, but really, there's a lot of them that have thinner shells. Uh, people talk about a paper shell pecan, and a paper shell just is kind of a descriptive word for how thick the shell is. It doesn't mean that it's been grafted or it's an improved variety, it just means that the shell is thinner. And a lot of people use it interchangeably for improved varieties. But if we look at some of the different types of pecans that we use in some of our orchards in Oklahoma and other parts of the country, some of these were selected as natives so they were grown like the Mount. It is a pecan that was in a native grove in around Beggs, Oklahoma on the Mount Ranch. And so it was a consistent producer, had good quality. And so the Mount family selected that pecan, started taking graft wood, sharing it with others. And so now we have that improved variety called Mount. And so some of the others that are listed on here, like Kansas, Lakota, Pawnee, Choctaw, with the Native American names, those were all released from the U USDA. And so they were went through a breeding process to develop those cultivars. But like Merrimack pecan, it was actually a seedling that was found in Merrimack, Oklahoma. And it was growing in just next to a house there in Merrimack. It was probably a Mahan seedling, but we know that when you plant a nut, the tree that's produced from that nut is not going to produce identical pecans to the original tree. So you can see there's a lot of different uh, choices in size and shape and how they, um, they, even how they taste. Some of these taste uh, much better than others. I personally like the smaller pecans. They usually have a higher oil content. Like our natives, they have much higher oil content. And right now there's, they're doing some research to look at the health benefits of native pecans versus improved varieties. And so they're showing that, that there are definite increases in some of the, uh, the oils and some of those uh, properties of the oils have a health benefit. So that's something to look forward to uh, hearing more research on, on some of those um, research projects that are going on at, at OSU and other areas across, across the country. There are um, a lot of differences in how they're managed. A native tree, like I said, there's a few inputs that native growers will have to do in their groves, but for an improved producer, an improved variety producer, they're gonna have to be more intensive management. So some of the varieties like Pawnee or Choctaw, some of the larger nuts will require irrigation. And so if you don't have enough water to produce these pecans and fill them out properly, then growers need to be thinking about growing something smaller like a Kansa. And so availability of water is, is a big issue. And then also a Pawnee versus Kansa, the Pawnee is gonna have much more uh, fungicide applications needed versus a Kansa. And then a Kansa may also even fit into a native grove where sometimes they can graft a Kansa or some of these other smaller nuts into a native grove and they will uh, be easily um, uh, fit into that production system, but boost the kernel percentage a little bit on those uh, overall production of those nuts. If you look at 
um, what I saw about kernel percentage, that means the amount of, of kernel to shell or packing material. So something that's got a very thin shell, something like a, a peruke has a very thin shell, it may be like 60% nut meat or 60% kernel is what we call it. Whereas some of the natives, like these very small ones, or some that have very thick shells, may have a 30 or a 35% kernel. So you have less nut meat per pound versus one of these with a thin shell. I'm excited about native pecans in Oklahoma, and I hope you have the opportunity to try a native pecan and see the differences between it and an improved variety. Check with your local pecan grower in your area, ask them if they have some, or you can forage some for yourself in a park or in a, near a creek bank or somewhere in the fall. This isn't the best time to be uh, looking for pecans, but later in the fall when they start to drop is, is ideal time to harvest. Today we are just outside of Fort Gibson at Greenleaf's Hidden Lake Nursery and joining me today is Mark Andrews. Mark, a lot of people are eating those delicious peaches this time of year, but you're working on the future crop of peaches, right. right? Right. So these crops that we're working on are for next year and future years beyond that. Okay, so we've got tiny little peach trees growing here, but these right. aren't what's going to be the finished product, right? No, this is just, these are young peach seedlings that are here in the field. And what we're going to do is use these to bud the improved varieties that everybody's looking for at the grocery store. So if they're looking for a Hale Haven peach or a Red Haven peach, whatever variety it is, that's what we bud onto these so that we know we've got a good consistent crop and that it's true to the name of the, of the peach. Okay, so when you say bud, what we're talking about is grafting yes. a improved um, cultivar on top of a hardy rootstock, right? Correct. So these are the rootstock. This is the rootstock right here, okay. right now. So yep. what, what is the budding process or the grafting process that we're so doing? So what today? we do is we collect wood from known trees. Okay. So we go to orchards where we already know what the tree is and we collect wood from that particular variety. And then what we do is we take small little buds and we go ahead and graft those onto these seedlings. Okay. And then after the bud goes ahead and heals onto that tree and everything, then we break the seedling tree off and put all the energy into that bud and start a whole new tree okay. so, that is true to the name of the variety. So how long does that process take to actually get that new bud to heal on there and start growing? Uh, with peaches, they're fairly rapidly growing plants. So what we'll be doing is we'll be grafting them right now at this time of year mm -hmm. uh, in you know early summer. And in about four to five weeks is when we'll come back and we'll start bending these tops of these trees over. Okay because by then they'll be healed onto there and we want to start pushing the growth into that bud and start the new tree. Okay. Why do you bend them over instead of just cutting the tops off? It seems to work better to bend it over. There's still a little bit of energy that comes from the leaves and everything like that to feed the plant and everything. And, but by breaking it over, you're disrupting the, uh, the growing the tissue, the, the xylem that transmits the nutrients and water. So we're stopping that from going up into the rest of it. It's all going to the bud, okay. but there's still enough leaves to kind of support the plant right. and keep it going. Okay, all right, so you've got next year's crop growing over next to us also. Mm -hmm. right. So those are the ones that have that scion wood already growing out, Correct. right? So are those ready to sell yet or where are we those at Those trees, for the way that Greenleaf Nursery operates, is those trees will be dug this winter mm -hmm. and then we will put them into containers and grow them for one more growing season and then we will sell them okay. to the end consumers. All right, so we've got them. So we're still two years away, even with what we've got here. And, and these are a year old, right? You grew these as these seedlings. These seedlings so, are a year old, So yes. you've got, what, now four years invested in that Correct. peach tree before it gets to the Correct. nursery, really? Yes. So yep. that, that's what we can soon see at next year's nurseries. Is correct. That correct, All that's right. right. Thank you, Mark, so much mm -hmm. for sharing this with us. You're welcome.
Today we want to show you the tree that we have chosen for the Oklahoma Proven Program for 2022, and that is the ginkgo. Uh, this is a fun tree. I love it. It's one of my favorites. It's kind of a unique tree because it is one of a kind. So the genus is ginkgo and the species is ginkgo biloba, and that's it. There is no other species within the genus ginkgo. The other cool thing about this is they have found fossils of the leaves that date back to what they think is maybe 150 million years ago. It is a native to China, so it's not a native of ours, but it is a very tough tree. Uh, it tolerates a wide variety of soil conditions. It's a great urban or street tree because it tolerates compacted soils and dry soils quite well. Um, just really needs well-drained soils, uh, or pretty well-drained soils, so you don't want it sitting in water. But other than that, this is a pretty tough tree, uh, pretty much pest-free, um, good, clean, beautiful foliage. Um, it's called biloba because if you look at the leaf, um, you can see that it's kind of split in two, creating two lobes. It's a nice fan-shaped leaf, and the veins of the leaves are almost parallel to each other. Um, so it's bright, bright green during the summer, um, and then in the fall, it actually turns a bright yellow color, which is really cool. Now this is a dioecious tree, meaning there's a male and female form of the tree. Um, it's usually a good idea to choose a male form um, to avoid the nasty fruit that the female can produce. Um, they're actually a large fleshy cone, and when they, fall, you know, when they ripen and fall to the ground, they're really stinky and messy. So usually it's a good idea to choose one that we know is a male form of the, of the species. Um, if you go into the garden center and just buy a, a ginkgo biloba or ginkgo, or it's also called maidenhair tree, um, and there's no designation of what it could be, um, you may not know what it is until it matures like 15, 20 years later. I mean, it takes a long time for it to mature, uh, which is another thing that's kind of nice about this tree to some degree is it's very slow grower. Uh, this tree here um, that we're standing under, uh, it is, it's been in here for at least 25 years. And um, I'm guessing it's probably only about 30 feet tall now. So it's a slow grower, which again can be a plus or a minus. Because it's slow, you know, you don't really have to worry much about it getting out of control and really have to worry about pruning it or anything like that. So if you're looking for a great tree that is easy to grow, trouble-free, has wonderful summer foliage and really bright yellow fall color, then this might be a great tree for you. We recently learned about how important it is to preserve plants in herbariums. But we're, as we head into the digital world, we're learning more about how important it is to also digitize some of this. Joining us today is Dr. Mark Fishbein, who is the director of the OSU Herbarium. Uh, Dr. Fishbein, tell us a little bit, I guess you recently won a grant, is that correct, to help with this process? Yeah, we're actually about two years into a National Science Foundation funded project to bring these plant specimens to the world. And uh, this is part of a regional consortium with many herbaria across the states of Oklahoma and Texas. Okay, so probably about 50 or so herbariums, I'm assuming, is that correct? Or? Yeah, it, there's about 40 in our two states that are involved in this project. Plus, we are collaborating with the New York Botanical Garden, Missouri Botanical Garden, Harvard University and other places that have many collections from our states. Oh, wow. So, so you have these plants scattered throughout Oklahoma and Texas and other areas that you're trying to digitize. Why is that so important? Well, the, there's several reasons. One is to minimize wear and tear on the specimens. So mm -hmm. many people want to study our specimens or use them um, in teaching or in outreach projects, but they're not accessible to everybody. So by having them digitized and online, not only can many people use them, but for many purposes, they're just as good as digital objects as they are as physical specimens that can be studied. That's amazing. So you're taking it global. Tell us, show us a little bit about this website, if you would. Please. Sure. This is our Torch, uh, Texas Oklahoma Regional Consortium of Herbaria uh, data portal, um, and from here we can search collections not only from Texas and Oklahoma, but from 
around the world on this platform. But for today, I just want to show you uh, that we can study specimens specifically from our herbarium. Okay. And I'm going to use as an example the ground cherries that were the uh, research focus of one of my predecessors, UT Waterfall. I'm going to enter some information, a genus name, into the search box here. And is this something anybody can do if you're wanting this to? Is, this is the public face of the okay. portal. So right. anybody can search for, by scientific name, by localities, by collectors, many different criteria. Okay. And when I do this, I pull up uh, 1,738 records, which are the number of digitized specimens of ground cherries that we have in our herbarium. And because of Waterfall's work, we have specimens from Mexico and all over the world, um, one of the best collections of this genus in the world. Because the current digitization project is focused on Texas and Oklahoma specimens, let's take a look at one of these ground cherry specimens that was collected in Texas. And so when we click on the image, it pulls up the record, and we can see that the collector, the collector's collection number, the date, so very, the location, various information about the collection. So this is that all the same information that you would find on the actual card too? That's right, so if we look at this more closely and we can zoom in, we can see that this information was transcribed off the label. And we have this beautiful high resolution view of the specimen, which can be studied almost to the same extent that you would get from a dissecting microscope. Although, um, for some purposes, you'd really need to see the physical specimen, but you can tell for many purposes, this would be completely sufficient. Yeah. So obviously this is important not only for people to have access to all over the world, but also they're not physically handling all of your cards, potentially damaging them and, and that sort of thing as well. Right. Yeah, to me it's those two things, increased accessibility, anybody in the world can see them, and then reduced wear and tear on the specimens. At, at OSU, we've imaged all of our Texas and Oklahoma specimens, and now we're in the process of transcribing them. So for, and, and other collections may be further along or not quite as far uh -huh. as we are. I mean, this is, it seems like a lot of work. <laughs> it is a tremendous amount of work. It's a four-year grant um, to uh, image and transcribe and find the digital coordinates for two million specimens wow. is our goal. And so here's an example of one that we need additional work on. So we have the image on the specimen. But you see there's really no information, just we only know that it's in Texas. Okay. So we would have a student worker in the herbarium or potentially a volunteer come in and access this image and then transcribe this information into our database. Okay. And in fact, that's the biggest chunk of work we have left to go. So who all is doing this? You mentioned mm -hmm. some students, but mm -hmm. that seems like you're not going to get that done in four years. Yeah, I think just with student workers, we might not get to our goal. So we're looking for, uh, for volunteers. There are some uh, citizen science platforms. There's one called Notes for Nature mm -hmm. that we can send our images to and then interested people, and there are many interested people around the world, can log into that platform and do transcriptions because they love learning about history or about plants, um, plant distributions or plant taxonomy. Um, and we also are happy to have volunteers work directly with us at the herbarium. Okay, so they mm. can actually come in and do it that way or online, mm. wherever you are. You wherever can. you are. So I think they can just contact me directly and um, my email address is mark.fishbein at okstate.edu. And also, I can be contacted through our web portal at uh, portal.torchherbaria.org. All right, excellent. Well, this is a great resource to know about, not only if you're just interested in learning about plants, but especially if you want to help with this effort. So thank you, Dr. Fishbein, for joining us. And we love to check back in with you on this progress as it continues. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for coming. There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead.
next week on Oklahoma Gardening, we've got more horticulture coming your way. Join us as we show you more plants that are thriving in this heat. So be aware of that. But other than that, it's a great plant. Plant. And okay. Bailey, I'm gonna need to drive better. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Tulsa Garden Center at Woodward Park, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, Smart Pot, and the Tulsa Garden Club. 